Endometriosis is a estrogen hormonally uh, stimulated condition, so it is very estrogen dependent. Um, the sort of the two biggest categories of treatment are surgery and or medication. So in patients, uh, it's very appropriate to, if someone has symptoms that might suggest endometriosis and they don't have a big pelvic mass and they don't have symptoms that suggest very deeply infiltrative disease that's like obstructing the bowel or obstructing the urinary tract, it actually is very appropriate to empirically treat these patients with some type of hormonal suppression, something like a birth control pill or progestin only method. And only in those patients whose symptoms don't get better do we go on to surgery. And then uh, if a patient is taken to surgery and endometriosis is found, it's definitely recommended that at the same time that uh, those patients undergo excision and or ablation or like burning of those endometriosis uh, lesions. We do like at least some minimal amount of excision so that uh, the diagnosis can be uh, confirmed by histology, like looking at the tissue under the microscope, because that's the only way to definitively confirm the diagnosis. And you know, most uh, surgeons that treat this regularly prefer excision, uh, cutting out the lesions rather than just trying to burn them uh, for various reasons. Um, but in general, once surgery is performed, um, it is considered a chronic condition. Um, there's a relatively high risk of recurrent symptoms after surgery, and uh, the the, the, our best tools to try to reduce that risk of recurrence is putting patients back on hormonal suppression, like a, some type of hormonal medication to reduce the risk of recurrence. Um, it's not perfect, um, but those, that's sort of the range of the items in our toolbox that we specifically currently have for endometriosis. Family history is definitely an important risk factor. We know that there is a genetic predisposition. It does tend to run in families. It's not um, uh, related to one specific gene mutation. It's a, um, you know, there are multiple uh, genetic factors that might contribute. Um, there's some suspicion that there might be some environmental factors, but uh, in terms of environmental toxins, but that data is pretty murky and not entirely clear, so we don't give patients any specific precautions that they could you know, um, avoid to avoid the disease. Um, but in general, um, it, you know, we do, there, it's more likely to be identified in younger reproductive age women. So in their early 20s um, is, is probably the most common age at diagnosis. Um, uh, it tends to be more common in thinner women. Uh, it's not that obesity necessarily protects you, but it's more likely to be identified in, in thinner women. There's definitely a lot of interest in environmental and dietary factors. Um, some things have come out in very large population-based studies, but um, it's really difficult to say causation and how but most of those factors tend to have just very mild influences, and so um, again, I think it's it's difficult to you know really advise patients that they should avoid certain foods or um, chemicals uh, because the you know the relationship is not entirely clear or you know very strong. I think part of why we're hearing more about it is I think there's increased awareness um, about the condition um, and better support of patient advocacy and physician education to um, really help educate both patients and providers that this is an important condition to recognize and, and to treat. Um, it does have a significant impact on you know, patients' quality of life. It has an impact on fertility. You know, it's one of the most common things that are also identified in women that have uh, difficulty becoming pregnant. We know it's associated with, you know, even amongst women that get pregnant, it's associated, it's, been recently associated with increased risk of adverse pregnancy related outcomes, so more complications uh, during pregnancy. And so I think the awareness is, is increasing as our knowledge of the disease is improving. There is some literature that's looked at 
non-pharmacologic as well as behavioral as well as non-hormonal and non-surgical treatments for endometriosis. There's definitely evidence that suggests that at least in some women with endometriosis they have more widespread pain um, and more sort of chronic pain um, symptoms and many of the ways that we treat that like other chronic pain disorders are often likely effective in this population as well. Um, and so while I can't specifically comment on cannabis or its, um, you know, uh, family of, of, you know, compounds, um, we do know in general patients, you know, with the endome some of them at least have centralized pain and all of the treatments that we often use in other centralized pain syndromes probably have a role, at least in a subset of women with endometriosis. One of the biggest challenges in this patient population is that, you know, there's a big delay in the diagnosis. I think that there's a, a minimization of, you know, pain in women and reproductive um, type health issues, you know, related to pain. And, you know, while we're trying to do a better job of educating gynecologists, I think that our target audience needs not just be gynecologists, but needs to be pediatricians, needs to be primary health providers, uh, needs to be nurses and, you know, in high schools and middle schools, because this is uh, more often than not who, uh, when the symptoms begin in these young adolescent years, when, you know, these are the physicians that are often the first to see these patients um, in these, you know, when their symptoms first begin. And so, improving our outreach and our education to uh, those population of providers and patients I think could be incredibly impactful you know for these patients to help get them to the right doctors get them the right treatment early in the course of the disease before um, the disease progresses before it has you know the life impact changes that it can often have that you know we suspect are probably worse with delays in diagnosis.